All right, so welcome to um, yet another rendition of Global Immunotalk. And I'm here with Sunny Shin. She's our guest today, and it's such a pleasure to have her. But before I introduce Sunny, though, I have a brief announcement. So this is my, um, my last time as host for Global Immunotalks. And I have to say, it was a, truly a great pleasure and a privilege to work on Global Immunotalks. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the initiators, Elena and Carla specifically, for getting me on board, for starting this amazing initiative. It's been a joyride, and I've been super, super, I've been super happy to have been part of the team. Enough of this, so we could have a moment of silence, but uh, I think we might just well go on and now go uh, over to, to Sunny. And uh, Sunny is originally from New York. Um, she uh, received her bachelor uh, from the MIT, where she worked <clears throat> with Hede Pluch. And then in uh, 2004, she graduated at Stanford, where she did her PhD with Chen. Uh, and then um, she did her postdoc with Craig Roy at, uh, uh, at, at Yale. And she was recruited to the Department of Microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine as an assistant professor in 2011. And uh, uh, big news is Sunny was promoted to full professor uh, this year. Congratulations. And uh, Sunny is also the vice chair of diversity and inclusion. Now, Sunny Chin, uh, Sunny Chin, uh, uh, received several honors, uh, several awards, and I can't name them all here, but we selected a couple as she got the Borough Welcome Fund Award. She is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, and, uh, and uh, she received the uh, uh, Penn Medicine Michael P. Nussbaum Graduate Student Mentoring Award. And this is something I sh should mention that uh, Sunny is, is particularly committed to mentoring the next generation of, of scientists and uh, in the promotion of diversity, equity, and inclusion in academia and in science. Now, about her research, I mean, she'll talk about it much more eloquently and interestingly than I could possibly do it, but it, it really focuses on innate immune defense against bacterial pathogens, but also interestingly in turn on how pathogens and the mechanisms of pathogens, how they evade host immunity and how they cause disease. Now, uh, Sunny, as you know, one of the things we do here at Global Immunotalks, we ask a, a question, a more generic question about something and in this case i'd like to ask you um what is your mentoring mentorship style and was it always like that or uh, did it evolve over time yeah so thank you um for cars i just want to first thank you for that great introduction and um congratulations to you on finishing your two-year stint as a co-host of global Media talks i'm really honored to be your last um person that you're hosting um and as far as the question um you know i just want to say that um, first of all, I think um, mentoring is such an incredible privilege and honor, and is really, um, for me, the reason why I decided to stay in academia, because I really care about mentoring. It's, it's just such a joy to help people um, grow and develop as scientists and help them fulfill um, their potential. Um, I think in terms of my mentoring philosophy or style, I really um, take a people-first approach to mentoring, um, so I really emphasize to all of my trainees within and outside my lab that I value them versus people, that they have intrinsic self-worth as people, right? That's independent from how productive they are, you know, in terms of their academics or in terms of their lab work. Um, and that, you know, like it's really you know important for me and for them to prioritize their uh, mental and physical health and well-being. Um, Cause I think it's really important to be, you know happy and healthy as people in order to be able to do good science. Um, that includes all of us as PIs as well. I think it's something PIs sometimes forget that we have to take care of our own um, health and well-being. Um, and I really tried to create an environment where it's okay for um, trainees to make mistakes and learn to fail because you know what we're doing in terms of doing research, we're at the um, you know cusp of knowledge of trying to discover new things. It's really a hard pursuit, right? Very difficult to do. And so there's a lot of failure along the way. And I, I think it's really important for students to realize that they're um, you know, and postdocs to realize that it's okay to fail. Um, yeah, and, and so I think in terms of, um, you know, how my mentoring styles changed over the past 12 years, I think, um, you know, I've, I've really learned that it's important to tailor my mentoring style to each person. Each person's so different in terms of your own unique strengths. Um, 
you know, areas where they could improve, right? And also in terms of what their career goals are and also their personal priorities. Um, and so, you know, I think like it's, I've learned that's really important to be humble and to learn from your trainees, right? I've learned, I think, a lot from my trainees on how to be a better mentor. Um, and, you know, I feel like I'm still constantly improving and learning and it's, it's always new with each new person that comes into my lab. Um, so, yeah. Very, uh, very good, Sonny. Thank you. Uh, that uh, I, 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 I would agree with you. Actually, this is. Um, however, I think one of the main reasons why we're having you here is to to talk about your your work. And uh, it's now time. The floor is yours. Please share your screen and let's get started. Yeah. Okay. Um. So let's see. Sharing now, and hopefully that looks okay. Everything looks great. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Um, so I just really want to again thank all the organizers for um you know organizing this fantastic um summer series. I think this really saved a lot of us, especially during the pandemic. Um, and also just you know the realization that this helps make science so accessible to everyone around the world. Um, and so thank you to all of you for doing this. Um and so I'm going to talk to you about um some a few projects from our lab. Um and so, you know, we've been really interested in understanding um, host defense against intracellular bacterial pathogens. And I'm going to focus on a lot of our work involving um, inflammasomes. Um, and so first, I just want to give, um, you know, a brief introduction to um, what we study. And so our lab is really interested in studying um, intracellular bacterial pathogens, um, as these are really important causes of, um, you know, human disease around the world. Um, but bacterial path these types of intracellular bacterial pathogens are really fascinating to me as well because they have this remarkable ability to invade and replicate within um, our own cells. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is actually a microscopy image of a macrophage that was seen with DAPI that was taken by, by my postdoc advisor, Craig Roy, uh, many years ago. And so you can see the macrophage's nucleus here in the middle of the slide. And then um, this macrophage is infected with a single Legionella bacterium, which would be one of these um, rod-shaped organisms here. And over the course of 16 hours, you can see that the bacteria have replicated to huge numbers that take over the entirety of this macrophage. Um, and so we're really fascinated by how these bacterial pathogens are able to um, thrive within the hostile environment of professional phagocytes such as macrophages, which you know have a normal function in killing these types of bacteria. Um, um, and you know, and, and in turn, of course, how um, bacterial pathogens are able to evade host defenses and do this. And then, you know, um, and then, of course, you know, how does the immune system overcome this threat posed by such intracellular bacterial pathogens to be able to successfully control and clear them from the body? Um, and so over the several past years, we've um, expanded our studies to work on a variety of bacterial pathogens. And so we work on several intracellular bacterial pathogens, including Legionella, um, Coxyla brunettii, um, and Salmonella typhimurium. And more recently, we've expanded our studies to an extracellular pathogen, um, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, to understand um, shared um, principles of innate immune defense and also the unique ways the immune system has to deal with these different bacterial pathogens that reside within different niches within the host cell and also within the hosts. Um, and we also um, do a lot of work um, in and mouse models of infection, but we've also expanded over the past several years to look at human models to study evolutionary differences and how the immune system able, is able to respond to bacterial pathogens um, in both mice and humans. And so for today's talk, I'm gonna talk about um, two brief stories. Um, and so the first um, story is understanding how the immune system is able to overcome the ability to, of bacteria to um, inhibit host protein synthesis to ensure robust immune response during um, pulmonary bacterial infection. And the second story will um, um, delve into one of the stories in our lab about how um, differences in how mouse and humans um, use inflammasomes to respond to infection. Um, and so for the first story, um, um, you know, we've been have had a long-standing interest in how um, an effective immune response is generated against um, respiratory bacterial pathogens. And so it's not a surprise to any of us in this audience as we've um, been living through an ongoing um, global pandemic with an airborne um, pathogen um, that there are, um, we now realize that there's uh, many microbes in the air. And um, in general, it's been estimated about a million microbes per cubic meter of air with um, about a thousand microbes that you inhale into the lung with um, every um, breath that you take. Um, 
what's really um, remarkable to me is that um, the human lungs is one of the largest mucosal surfaces um, open to the outside world with the um, surface area of human lungs uh, um, being approximately the size of a tennis court with about 1,500 uh, miles of airway within them. Um, and that's quite remarkable, but then when you think about it, um, there's actually a relative paucity of any immune cells present within the lung. Um, it's been estimated actually that, um, you know, the only immune cells within the lung are actually abromacrophages and within the lung airway, and there's only about one abromacrophage patrolling every three alveoli. And these abromacrophages are often the cell type that are hijacked by um, successful bacterial pathogens, such as Legionella and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and so how do these cells uh, mount an effective immune response against these types of pathogens? And so um, for many years now, uh, we've used um, um, Legionella pneumophila as a model to study um, any immune defense against bacterial infection. Um, so Legionella um, in its own right is a um, bona fide pathogen and it's considered to be an important cause of um, community um, and hospital acquired pneumonia. And so, um, Legionella is a really interesting bacterium because it's um, found ubiquitously throughout freshwater environments where the bacteria um, are found within rivers, lakes, and streams. Um, however, because of um, modern technologies such as air conditioning, um, fountains, um, showers, um, etc., anything that can aerosolize water, um, if these water sources become contaminated with um, bacteria, they can be inhaled into the human lung where the bacteria can go on to infect our macrophages and cause the severe pneumonia known as Legionnaire's disease. Um, one thing I'll note is that this is really considered to be an accidental pathogen of humans. Um, we're a dead-end host. And the reason why is because Legionella hasn't evolved to evade mammalian innate or adaptive immune defenses. And so most um, healthy individuals when they come into contact with Legionella are able to successfully control infection. And it's really the elderly immunocompromised that have difficulty in controlling infection. And so we think of Legionella as an example of an environmental bacterium that many of us probably come into contact with and maybe on a daily basis. Um, and so it's a pathogen where you know, our immune system does a pretty good job of controlling it. And so we think of it as a nice system to dissect um, components of any immune system involved in successful clearance of such environmental pathogens. Um, and so in order to um, cause disease, Legionella, um, like many um, um, bacterial pathogens, uses, utilizes a specialized secretion system. In the case of Legionella, it uses a type 4 secretion system, which acts as a molecular syringe to allow Legionella to inject over um, 300 bacterial effector proteins into the um, cytosol of macrophages. And these effector proteins allow Legionella to avoid endolysosomal fusion, where the bacteria normally get killed. And instead, um, allow the legionella containing vacuole to um, hijack ER dried membranes in order to um, in order to remodel this compartment in ER dried organelle where the bacteria can replicate for about 16 to 24 hours before um, the bacteria egress from the cell and go on to infect neighboring cells. And so this type of secretion system is essential for legionella to cause this disease, but it's also its Achilles heel. Um, because it does make Legionella vulnerable to sensing by a wide variety of um, cytosolic immune sensors. And so these include um, members of the Nodic receptor family, including Nod1 and 2, which sense bacterial peptidoglycan, um, various nucleic acid sensors, such as um, C-gas, Sting, um, Regain and MDA5, um, which sense um, um, DNA as well as um, RNA. And then a wide variety of um, different inflammasomes um, which can sense um, bacterial products such as flagellin and LPS or translocated by secretion system. And these inflammasomes are these multi-protein ciliating complexes that can then go on to activate various um, enzymes such as caspase-1 and caspase-11 that then can lead to um, parotidic cell death and elimination of this re replicative niche. Um, however, um, Legionella um, does have um, a few um, weapons in his arsenal, including the ability to um, potently block host protein synthesis. So this is an evolutionary conserved process from um, Legionella's natural host amoeba to um, humans. And so Legionella has um, about a dozen effector proteins that potently inhibit host ribosomal initiation as well as elongation, resulting in a greater than 95% block in protein synthesis. 
And so you would expect that this block and protein synthesis would then um, thwart the ability of macrophages to mount an effective immune response against Legionella. However, paradoxically, there's a robust immune response against Legionella that occurs within infected cells um, that's even greater than compared to Legionella lacking this type of secretion system. And so several years ago, um, my first um, immunology graduate student, Alan Copenhaver, set out to understand what was the basis for his response. And so through the use of single cell um, reporter systems where he could um, interrogate immune responses and directly infected macrophages, as well as neighboring uninfected macrophages during the course of um, pulmonary infection in Legionella, what he found was that these outer macrophages are actually um, impaired in their ability to produce the majority of inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF and IL-12, due to this block and protein synthesis imposed by Legionella. Um, however, he found that these macrophages are still capable of um, de novo synthesis of um, pro I1 alpha and I1 beta. And then um, these cytokines are actually um, you know, held inactive in the macrophage until there's inflammasome activation that occurs, that allows for the processing and release of these cytokines. And so in these directly infected cells, we get inflammasome activation that allows for release of I1 alpha and I1 beta. Um, and instead, what he found was that um, neighboring uninfected cells, including um, resident and recruited um, cell types such as macrophages, dendritic cells, monocytes, and neutrophils were the primary cells that were producing TNF and IL-12 in response to infection. Um, and so we hypothesize that because um, these infected cells are capable of producing IL-1 alpha and IL-1 beta, that these cytokines may be acting as a damp um, to signal to these um, bystander cells to instruct them to produce these key cytokines, TNF and IL-12, that we know were essential for the control of Legionella infection. And so to test this hypothesis, um, Alan examined um, the ability of wild-type mice as well as iron receptor deficient mice to make um, cytokine responses to Legionella. And what he found was that compared to the wild-type mice where they produce robust levels of TNF IL and IL-12 as well as other cytokines um, 24 hours post um, intranasal infection of Legionella, the iron receptor knockout mice had a severe defect um, in their ability to um, mount responses against Legionella and had a defect in control of infection. And so that suggested a model to us then whereby um, infected avar macrophages are releasing IL-1 that then signals to these bystander cells and instructs them to produce these um, critical cytokines and for control of infection. And so at that time, Alan um, graduated from the lab and a really talented postdoc, Jen Liu, um, came to the lab and she became really interested in understanding how IL-1 was doing this. And so I think many of us know that IL-1 is considered to be a, a, a very pro-inflammatory cytokine, um, but the exact mechanisms by how IL-1 does this, I think are still poorly understood. And so what Jen wanted to then ask was, um, you know, how is IL-1 doing this? So all these cell types do express IL-1 receptor. And so, um, you know, she hypothesized that IL-1 may directly instruct these immune cells. And so through a series of bone marrow chimera experiments, I don't have time to show you for the sake of time, um, what um, um, Jen found to her surprise is actually that IL-1 receptor signaling was dispensable on immune cells for um, their ability to produce cytokines. Instead, IL-1 was signaling through a non-hematopoietic cell within the lung to drive these bystander cytokine responses and control of infection. And so we consider then the types of cells within the lung that might be responding to IL-1. And so um, within the alveolar space, there are two primary um, cell types. There are type 1 alveolar epithelial cells, which have a homeostatic role in gas exchange as well as these type two alveolar epithelial cells, which constitutes the majority of alveolar epithelial cells within the lung. Um, these cells have a critical homeostatic role in secreting pulmonary surfactant. Um, but these cell types, um, the cell type is also known to express a variety of innate immune receptors, including TLRs, as well as IL-1 receptor, and has been shown to be um, IL-1 responsive or can produce cytokines and chemokines in response to um, TLR or, um, or IL-1 stimulation. And so we wanted to then test the hypothesis that ion receptor signaling through these type 2 outer epithelial cells um, wasn't required for generating these responses. And so um, we generated mice um, expressing a floxylil I1 receptor um, crossed to um, mice expressing pre-recombinase under the control of the surfactant protein C or SPC promoter. 
which is expressed only in type 2 ever epithelial cells, to allow for the specific deletion of ion receptor on these type 2 cells. And it's a tamoxifen inducible CRE. So following tamoxifen injection, we then infected the mice intranasally with Legionella. And so what we um, found was that when we deleted ion receptor on these type 2 cells, that there was indeed a severe defect in the ability of these mice to produce IL-12 and other cytokines in response to infection. And these mice exhibited a, a log increase in bacterial loads um, compared their, to the litter mate controls or to mice that did not receive tamoxifen. And so these um, studies suggested to us then that ion receptor signaling on type 2 ever epithelial cells um, is necessary. And in other experiments, um, we also found that ion receptor signaling on these type 2 cells is sufficient for driving these cytokine responses and control of Legionella infection. And so that suggested to us then that these type 2 ever epithelial cells must be generating yet another host factor that then is licensing these bystander cells um, to produce cytokines. And so we hunted for this factor by using a combination of um, Luminex profiling um, to look for host factors are produced in an ion receptor dependent manner, along with cross referencing the literature to look at what cytokines can be produced by type 2 ever epithelial cells. And the primary candidate that emerged from those studies was GMCSF. Um, so you've heard a lot about GMCSF from Burkhard Becker in his previous global immune talk. And so it's a really fascinating cytokine. Um, so GMCSF um, is traditionally thought of as a growth factor, stands for granulocyte uh, monocyte factor. And so it indeed is known to be a growth factor and has been shown um, by several groups to be important for um, the um, differentiation and homeostasis of alveolar macrophages. Um, knockout mice lacking GMCSF also have a slight defect in certain DC populations, such as the C103 positive DCs. But um, work by uh, many labs, um, including um, um, Burkhardt's lab, has shown that GMCSF can be a critical driver of pathological inflammation in a variety of autoimmune diseases, including multiple sclerosis and arthritis. Um, um, and then it can also um, be critical for host defense against a wide variety of um, pathogens. And de depicting here are some um, respiratory pathogens, including TB, aspergillus, um, blastomyces, and um, flu infection. And so we set out to then ask, you know, is GMCSF required for host defense against Legionella as well? Um, and so to do this, um, uh, we decided to um, use acute antibody-based blockade as the knockout mice like alveolar macrophages. And what you can see here is that um, compared to mice treated with the isotype control, um, mice um, acutely blocked with anti-GMCSF antibodies have a severe defect in production of IL-12 and other inflammatory cytokines and have a defect um, in the control of Legionella infection, as you can see on this right-hand graph. Um, and so through those studies, as well as other studies, um, we've shown that um, non-hematopoietic cells, likely the alveolar epithelium, um, in response to IL-1, are producing GMCSF, and that um, we believe that GMCSF is this licensing factor that's telling these cells to produce these inflammatory cytokines. And so um, in newer data, we then wanted to ask, where is GMCSF required um, as all these different cell types do express a GMCSF receptor? Um, and so we were very fortunate to embark upon a collaboration with Burkhard Becker as his um, group had previously generated mice expressing a flox allele of the GMCSF receptor, as well as mice expressing CRE recombinase under control of the CCR2 promoter, which allows for monocyte specific deletion of the GMCSF receptor um, in these mice. And so through the use of these mice, we um, found that compared to the um, wild type mice, um, mice lacking GMCSF receptor and monocytes have a severe defect in the production of TNF and other cytokines, and also have a defect in the control of Legionella infection. And so those data then um, suggest to us um, that GMCSF receptor signaling specifically on monocytes is critical for the control of Legionella infection and the ability of these cells to produce cytokines. Um, and I should just mention that um, we have additional data where we've um, crossed um, those um, mice onto different Cree drivers, and we don't see a critical role for GMCSF receptor signaling and other cell types, um, uh, other myeloid cell types and control of Legionella infection. Um, and so um, Jin then wanted to know how exactly is GMCSF promoting inflammatory gene expression in these monocytes? Um, and so, 
um, genes to set signals through its receptor to activate the kinase JAK2, which can go on to phosphorylate to the transcription factor of STAT5 that can then go into the nucleus to drive gene expression. And so through the mining of publicly available um, chip seq data that was generated by Warren Leonard's group at NIH, um, Jen was able to find evidence of SAT5 recruitment um, to the enhancer and promoters of the I1 alpha and I1 beta genes. However, um, we didn't find evidence of SAT5 recruitment to other genes, such as TNF and IL-12, that we also knew were being controlled through the signaling axis. And so that suggested to us then that genes itself is controlling expression of these genes through a, um, a different mechanism. And so um, we hunted for that mechanism um, by performing um, a variety of approaches, including um, RNA-seq, um, which was not that informative, as well as other approaches. Um, and so eventually, after um, trying a few different approaches, um, we decided to go back to the old-fashioned um, way of, of hunting for mechanism, which is to do um, searches through the literature with um, PubMed and Google Scholar. Um, and so upon one of these late-night searches, um, um, I stumbled across this paper that was published several years ago in Journal of Immunology um, from a group that had nicely so shown that um, GMCSF promotes glycolysis in LPS-treated macrophages. Um, and so this paper um, caught our eye um, because we know now from the seminal work from many groups um, that a metabolic switch towards oral glycolysis actually is critical for TLR-dependent cytokine production in myeloid cells. And so we know that TLR signaling itself can lead to an increase in glycolysis. Um, and it's been shown um, through work from Lego Neal's group that this leads to HEF1 alpha stabilization to promote I1 transcription. Um, from Ed Pierce's group, group it's been shown that um, byproducts of glycolysis can lead to fatty acid synthesis to lead to ER and Golgi expansion to accommodate the increase in um, um, secretary protein load in myeloid cells. And the more recent um, work from Eichelatz's group has shown that um, um, glycolysis is critical for histone acylation to support um, TLR mediated gene expression. And so we hypothesize that perhaps GMCSF is then working in concert with TLR signaling to promote increased glycolysis in myeloid cells to allow for um, increased cytokine expression. And so Jen tested this hypothesis um, by examining um, glycolysis in um, monocytes ex vivo that were treated with Legionella and treated with either PBS or recombinant GMCSF. And so she um, analyzed these cells using a seahorse machine, which allows us to measure the extracellular acidification rate of these cells in real time as glycolysis um, leads to acidification of the media. And so you can see here that in black, that in PBS treated monocytes, you see a basal increase in glycolysis due to TLR dependent signaling. Um, and that when we treat these cells with recombinant GMCSF, we see this dramatic increase in glycolysis. Um, Jin then wanted to ask whether glycolysis is indeed required for this gene system enhanced cytokine production. And so um, what she did then is to take these monocytes and um, put them into glucose containing media, which allows glycolysis to proceed, or glucose free media, uh, where um, they have exposure to galactose instead as a carbon source, which um, effectively um, shuts off glycolysis. And so we can see here in the black bars that when the cells are treated with um, GMCSF, you can see this nice increase in um, the production of IL-12 as well as other cytokines. Um, and you can see this increase both at the transcriptional level as well as at the protein level. However, when these cells are swapped out uh, into glucose-free um, media containing galactose, you can see that um, there's blunting of this response, suggesting then that glycolysis is required for this enhanced response in monocytes. In newer data, we wanted to ask whether this is indeed the case in vivo um, during pulmonary infection. And so Jen produced mice um, expressing um, a conditional um, allele of LDHA or lactate dehydrogenase, which controls the terminal step in glycolysis, and crossed them to um, CCR2 cre mice. Um, to um, generate mice lacking LDHA in monocytes. So you can see here um, that these mice have a severe defect in cytokine production, and they also have a defect in control of legional infection. And so um, those data then suggest to us that one of the things that GMCS is doing is to um, um, license these monocytes to produce these inflammatory cytokines in part by 
um, reprogramming them to undergo increased glycolysis to help su support the ability of these cells to produce these inflammatory cytokines. Um, and so just to summarize then um, this part of the talk, um, we started out by asking um, what we thought was a relatively simple question of how infected macrophages are able to mount an effective um, cytokine response against um, Legionella when it has this ability to block protein synthesis. And so we've uncovered now this quite complex um, intracellular circuit um, whereby infected macrophages have a defect in the ability to produce um, many inflammatory cytokines are still able to um, synthesize and release ion alpha and ion beta. Um, these cytokines signal to type 2 epithelial cells and instruct them to produce the cytokine gene CSF. Gene CSF then signals to monocytes um, and metabolic aid reprograms them to undergo increased glycolysis. Um, I would, what I didn't have time to show you in newer data is that in addition to gene CSF, um, these monocytes also require um, TLR-derived signals in order to um, help promote this increasing glycolysis and cytokine production. And in turn, um, IL-12 produced by these uh, monocytes is critical for the ability of um, NK and T cells within the lung to produce interferon gamma. Um, that's critical for the control of Legionella. And what we think is happening then is that interferon gamma together with TNF is likely signaling back onto various myeloid cell populations, um, including um, agromacrophages, monocytes, and neutrophils to help promote um, antibacterial activities within these cell types to help um, control and clear infection. And so we've wondered um, you know, for some time now why this is such an elaborate and um, complicated circuit. But if you remember what I told you at the beginning of um, my talk, that there is a relatively small number of macrophages within the lung, and these cells are preferentially hijacked by um, you know, pathogens, that we think that um, the epithelium basically is acting as an amplification platform to amplify um, relatively small amounts of signals from these macrophages to help orchestrate a successful immune response against immune evasive pathogens. And so um, our studies have been um, really exciting and have really um, raised a lot of questions that um, um, we're actively pursuing in our lab, as well as um, Jen, who just started her own lab at Case Western, and she's pursuing her own, own lab, some of these questions. And so um, Jen is really interested in understanding how um, metabolic reprogramming regulates monocyte function and their differentiation into different cell types. Um, um, until the study, we were very, um, relatively myeloid cell-centric, um, and we didn't um, appreciate um, the important immune role that non-immune cells can play. And so we were really interested in understanding what other immune functions are carried out by ever epithelial cells um, within the lung against Legionella and other pathogens. And then um, we we're really interested in understanding what the role of this IL-1 gene CSF circuit is and host defends or pathological inflammation and other infectious as well as non-infectious diseases. And so with that, I'm going to now switch gears to talk about um, the second story, which involves um, our work understanding differences in how um, mice and humans um, use inflammasomes to respond to bacterial pathogens. Um, and so um, for this story, we're going to switch to another intracellular bacterium, um, Salmonella typhimurium. Um, and so Salmonella is an important um, gastrointestinal pathogen. Um, and Salmonella and many other bacterial pathogens use another um, specialized secretion system called a type 3 secretion system to translocate bacterial virulence factors into host cells. And so I'm just showing you here a cartoon of the um, um, secretion system where it indeed looks like a molecular syringe, where you can see that there's this um, um, base um, or basal body here um, that spans the inner and outer membrane, and there's a channel um, comprised of a, a protein called an inner rod protein. Um, and then there's a needle protein that polymerizes in, into forming this um, needle-like structure. And then finally, the translocon that forms a pore within the host plasma membrane through which um, bacterial effectors can be translocated from the bacterial cytosol all, all the way through into the host cell cytosol. And so the secretion system is, again, important for the ability of salmonella to cause disease. But um, like for Legionella, it's also its Achilles heel because the bacteria can uh, inadvertently translocate small amounts of um, the structural components of, of the secretion system, such as the needle protein in a rod 
or um, Vagellin, which um, um, comprises a bacterial flagellar apparatus, a bacteria you use to swim around in the environment. And so in mice, um, it's well appreciated now um, through um, beautiful work from many groups um, that there's a family of receptors called an ape family of receptors that have evolved to recognize these different bacterial ligands. Um, whereby NAEP1 recognizes the type 3 secretions as a needle protein, NAEP2 recognizes the inner rod protein, and NAEP5 and 6 recognize flagellin. And upon sensing their cognate ligands, these um, proteins recruit an adapter protein called LRC4 um, that allows for assembly into this wheel like structure that then recruits the um, cysteine protease caspase 1 that then um, can become enzymatically active and go on to cleave downstream substrates, um, such as IL-1 beta and IL-18, um, and um, lead to a form of pyrotonic cell death that allows for elimination of this infected cell and alerts neighboring cells um, about um, infection. And so this inflammasome, not surprisingly, is um, important in host defense against a wide variety of gram-negative bacteria, including Salmonella, Sumos, Originosa, Legionella, and Citrobacter rodentium. Um, however, this inflammasome um, does have, as a double-edged sword, it can also be pathological, and has, it's been shown to lead to sepsis following antibiotic disruption of the microbiota and outgrowth of antibiotic-resistant pathobionts. Um, and there have been human patients identified with gain of function mutations in the adapter protein LRC4 that can lead to severe autoinflammatory disease that can be treated with IL 18 blockade. And so, what's interesting is that in contrast to mice, which have multiple NAPE receptors, um, humans only have a single um, NAPE receptor. And so, the function of this NAPE receptor was um, poorly understood for um, several years. Um, until studies um, published by Feng Xiao's group um, about a decade ago um, show that human NAPE has the ability to recognize um, the needle protein from the type 3 secretion system, um, suggesting that human NAPE was a functional orthologue of mouse NAPE 1, and that humans perhaps had lost the ability to recognize these um, other proteins. Um, and so we um, decided to revisit um, the role of what NAEP was doing several years ago when we um, had some um, interesting preliminary data in our lab suggesting that human macrophages actually mount um, inflammatory responses to bacteria like Legionella in a flagellin-dependent manner. Um, and while we were doing those studies, um, Denise Monek's um, lab um, came to um, similar findings and they published this lovely paper um, in the Journal of Immunology several years ago um, showing that human NAPE, in addition to recognizing needle protein, can also recognize bacterial flagellin. And so at that time, um, a really talented graduate student, um, Valeria Reyes Ruiz, came to the lab and she became really interested in understanding um, what the role of human NAPE was and whether it can recognize um, other proteins, such as the inner rod protein, which is known to be recognized by um, mouse NAPE2. And so through a um, uh, many studies that um, I'm, I'm summarizing, summarizing just for um, sake of time, um, Valerio was able to find was that um, human NAPE has evolved to be a promiscuous um, receptor and recognize these three unrelated but quite distinct bacterial ligands, um, which was a really um, fascinating surprise for us. And at that time, um, Valeria, together with um, two other graduate students that came to the lab, Noir Nasir and Marissa Egan, then became interested in understanding what the functional consequences were of human NAPE um, recognition during salmonella infection. And so um, Valeria generated um, CRISPR um, Cas9 um, knockouts of NAPE as well as LRC4 and THP1 cells. And, and um, through the use of these cell lines, uh, what um, the graduate students were able to find was that um, compared to wild type um, THP1 cells in black, um, the NAPE knockout cells had a defect in inflammatory responses to salmonella infection. However, what you can appreciate is that um, there's still considerable IL-1 release um, from the NAPE knockouts. It's much higher than um, salmonella lacking um, its by one type 3 secretion system here. 
uh, suggesting then that there are um, inflammatory responses to salmonella that are being uh, mounted or uh, NEEP independent. And so through a variety of experiments, what um, they were able to show then that in addition to the NEEP LRT4 inflammasome, that the LRP3 inflammasome was also important for these responses to um, salmonella. Um, they became interested then in understanding um, whether um, these inflammasomes participate in the inhibition of salmonella replication within human macrophages. And so to do this, um, they examined um, replication of salmonella over the course of 24 hours within these macrophages. And so um, what um, Marissa found, one of the graduate students, is that in wild type macrophages, you see that salmonella can um, achieve about 20 to 30 fold growth over the course of 24 hours. Um, however, as you start um, knocking out or inhibiting these inflammasomes, either by using the nape knockouts in these pink triangles or by inhibiting um, the LP3 inflammasome with the pharmacological inhibitor MCC950, you can see that we achieve about 40 fold growth of salmonella within these cells. And that if we um, inhibit both the NAPE and LP3 inflammasomes and this, these um, teal triangles here, you can see that we're achieving about 60 fold growth of salmonella um, in these macrophages over the course of 24 hours. Um, and so we also examined this um, by fluorescence microscopy using GFP um, expressing salmonella. You can see here that in contrast to the wild type cells where we have um, relatively minimal replication of salmonella um, six hours post-infection, you can see in the NAPE knockout cells treated with um, the LRP3 inhibitor MCC950 that we're getting um, robust replication of salmonella within these cells and we're turning them into these little salmonella factories. And so Marissa quantitated this data and you can see here um, that um, compared to the wild type cells um, in black here, where um, we have about an average of five um, bacteria per cell um, at six hours post-infection, and the eighth knockouts treated with the LMP3 inhibitor MCC950, we're achieving as much as um, 40 bacteria per cell over the course of six hours. So really massive replication of salmonella within these cells. Um, and so subsequently, um, Marissa became really interested in understanding um, what downstream um, flammasome mediators actually are involved in restricting salmonella replication. Um, and so she decided to look at the downstream mediators, gastrin D and NINJ1. And so just to um, um, remind um, some of you, um, these inflammatory castases, um, castase one, as well as four and five, can cleave this um, protein gastrin D, um, liberating its end terminus, which then can go on to form a pore within the plasma membrane um, that allows for the release of IL-1 cytokines. Um, there's then another protein um, called NINJ1, which acts as a, a terminal executioner of, of cell death and leads to parietotic death of these cells. And so Marissa decided to test the roles of gastrin D and NINJ1 in control of salmonella infection. And so um, what she did was to take um, wild type cells or gastrin D knockout cells and measure um, inflammatory responses. And you can see here that compared to the wild type cells in this gray bar, the gastrin D knockouts here have a severe defect in cell death as well as I-1 cytokine release during salmonella infection. Um, and compared to the wild type cells, you can see that the gastrin D knockouts um, have increased replication of salmonella over the course of six hours. And she found um, similar results for the NINJ1 knockout cells. And so these data then suggested to us um, that both gastrin D and NINJ1 are contributing to the restriction of salmonella replication. Um, we then wanted to um, probe um, this replication a little bit further. Um, and um, for this, I want to tell you a little bit about how salmonella replicates within human intestinal epithelial cells. And so it was shown by um, Lee Noller um, several years ago in a seminal paper is that in, um, in intestinal epithelial cells, um, salmonella um, can replicate within a salmonella containing vacuole. And this is, was thought to be the dogma in the field for a long time, the salmonella replicates within a, um, these vacuolar compartments. But Lee Noller showed that in these intestinal epithelial cells, a subset of these salmonella can escape the vacuole and hyper-replicate within the cytosol. And so um, when we were looking at our images of um, 
macrophages, such as caspase 1 knockout macrophages infected with salmonella, you saw this massive hyperreplication of salmonella within these cells, and it really resembled some of the images we were seeing um, from Lee Nolder's group. And so we then wanted to um, interrogate um, you know, whether salmonella is replicating within salmonella containing vacuoles or whether it could be replicating replicating within the size of all of human macrophages, and whether these inflammasomes were playing a role in restricting one or both of these um, subcellular populations of salmonella. And so to um, assess this, we obtain um, these reporter constructs um, in which um, um, salmonella is expressing um, GFP under control of the UHPT promoter, which is responsive to glucose the host um, metabolite glucose 6-phosphate only within the host cell cytosol. And these bacteria also are expressing um, the fluorescent protein m cherry constitutively. And so if salmonella is found within a vacuolar compartment, it will only express m cherry, not GFP. But if salmonella is found within damaged vacuoles or within the cytosol where it has access to the host glucose 6-phosphate, um, it will turn on GFP. Um, and so what Marissa then did was to um, infect macrophages with these um, reporter strains. And what you can see here in the wild type macrophages, um, we can see that um, um, there's salmonella, they're expressing m cherry and not GFP. However, when she infected um, inflammasome deficient uh, macrophages, such as the Cassie's one knockout macrophages, you can see there's an increased number of bacteria within these cells now, and we see um, two different populations. We see um, cells where they only express M cherry um, and not GFP, but then we also see cells, what um, we like to call jackpot cells, um, where um, we see this hyperreplication of um, salmonella. And you can see that the salmonella are GFP positive, suggesting that they're within the size of all of these macrophages. And so Marissa quantitated this. Um, and you can see here that when we look at the number of bacteria per cell, um, we can see that as we um, progressively begin knocking out um, NAPE or Cassase 1, that we see an increase in the um, numbers of cytosolic bacteria in these macrophages. Um, and we do also see an increase in the um, numbers of vacuolar bacteria. So suggesting that um, these inflammasomes are restricting um, cell replication both within the vacuole and the cytosol but that the um, primary function of these inflammasomes is really to limit this hyperreplication of salmonella within the cytosol. And so we wanted to look further at um, um, the subcellular location of these salmonella, whether they were free living within the cytosol or whether they were found within damaged vacuoles. And so to do this, we collaborated with the electron microscopy core here um, to perform electron microscopy of infected macrophages. And so you can see here, um, in these mild type macrophages, we can see these salmonella, they're sort of color in green, and we can see this um, nice intact salmonella um, containing um, vacuolar membrane around these um, bacteria. In contrast, in the Cassius 1 knockout macrophages, you can see there are considerably more bacteria, um, and we can see um, bacteria that are found within mostly intact vacuoles, so, um, pointed to by these white arrows here. But then we can also see um, bacteria that are found within what look like damaged vacuoles, um, where you can see that there are um, gaps in the um, membrane of the salmonella-containing vacuole. And then you can also see this um, bacteria here, um, the black asterisk, where it seems to be mostly free-living um, with very little um, vacuolar membrane surrounding this bacteria. Um, and so we wanted to interrogate this a little bit more um, by using electron tomography in collaboration with Yue Chang here at Penn. Um, and so um, we took slices of um, cells um, and we can see here in this uh, movie um, is that these vacuoles are truly um, look like they're um, damaged. Um, and this is showing you a still image from the uh, movie um, where you can see that um, there's some vacuolar membrane surrounding this bacteria. We can see um, places where there's absolutely no membrane at all. And that these um, vacuoles are truly ruptured um, and allowing the bacteria to gain access to the cytosol. Um, and so what we think is happening then 
is in the wild type setting, um, salmonella infects these macrophages. And um, upon infection, you're getting activation of both the NAEP and the LRP3 inflammasomes. And that these responses really are helping to keep the salmonella in check and um, you know, so that they replicate primarily within the vacuole um, and not within the cytosol. However, in um, conditions where um, there's a lack of inflammasome activation, um, what we're seeing is that we're seeing increased replication of the salmonella, both in within um, these salmonella containing vacuoles, but then also um, um, salmonella found within these damaged vacuoles, and then um, hyperreplication of salmonella within um, um, the cytosol compartment of these cells. And so then to take a step back, um, what I've told you today is that unlike um, mice, which have multiple NAEP receptors that are specialized to each recognize a single vectoral ligand, um, humans use a single NAEP to detect multiple vectoral ligands um, that aid in the restriction of um, salmonella infection within these um, cells. And what's really interesting to think about from an evolutionary point of view um, is that um, it, most mammals actually, in addition to humans, um, possess a single NEEP, um, and that it really is only in rodents where they have evolved um, to have multiple NEEP receptors um, as a result of gene duplication events. Um, and so um, we would propose a hypothesis that um, in uh, rodents, um, in rats and mice, that there is some type of pathogen and post-selective pressure um, on these animals to evolve these multiple NAEPs that have become specialist receptors that have each evolved to um, be uh, really excellent at recognizing a single vector ligand, whereas a single NAEP in humans and other animals is a generalist NAEP that has evolved um, to promiscu promiscuously recognize these different ligands derived from the type 3 secretion system and flagellar apparatus. Um, in addition, um, one um, thing I just want to mention um, is that um, our other studies have suggested there are interesting um, and distinct cell type specific roles for um, this NAEP and flamosome in controlling salmonella infection in mice versus humans. And so there's been really beautiful work um, from Wolf Dietrich Hart's lab, as well as um, Isabella Rauch and um, Russell Vance, um, showing that in mice, um, the NAEP LRC4 inflammasome is both necessary and sufficient in intestinal epithelial cells for the control of salmonella infection and indeed is dispensable in immune cells, including in macrophages. And a more uh, recent paper that we published last year in co collaboration with um, Isabella Rauch, and she's co senior author with me on this paper, um, has shown that um, in human intestinal epithelial cells, actually, um, that the NAEP LG4 inflammasome um, is not really expressed and doesn't seem to be functional in these cells. And instead, um, you know, our data is suggesting that it really is macrophages and other immune cells where um, the NAEP LG4 inflammasome seems to be critical for detecting bacterial pathogens. And so I think that has really interesting implications for understanding um, salmonella pathogenesis in these different species. And just to give an example, we know that um, salmonella type for in humans is a self-limiting gastroenteritis, whereas in mice it can cause systemic type wood like disease. And so, um, you know, it's interesting to speculate that perhaps these um, evolutionary differences and where these inflammasomes are expressed um, in different cell types and how they function may contribute to these um, differences in disease pathogenesis. And so um, finally, um, we think that this research has really opened up um, a lot of interesting questions that we're interested in um, answering. For example, we're still interested in understanding how human NAEP broadly recognizes um, multiple bacterial ligands while the mouse names are so specific. Um, is there an evolutionary trade-off to having a generalist versus um, specialist NAEPs? Um, how does inflammasome activation restrict intracellular cellular replication within the size all of macrophages? And in turn, you know, our data is suggesting that salmonella is actually really happy to replicate in the size of all the human macrophages, um, despite um, human macrophages having many other um, any immune defenses. And so we're really interested in understanding how salmonella is able to um, do this and have this size all lifestyle within these um, cells. And so with that, I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, all the work. So as I mentioned, for the first half of the talk, it was 
initiated by his really talented graduate student, Alan Copenhaver, who's now a principal scientist at Takeda, and was continued by Jen Liu, a talented postdoc who just started her own lab at Case Western this past summer. Um, and then the work on human need was initiated by Valeria Reyes Ruiz, who's now a postdoc at Vanderbilt with Eric Scar, and then was continued by um, Marisa Egan and Noir Nasir, who both recently graduated as well. And Marisa is now a postdoc at CHOP, and um, Noir is a project manager here at Penn. And we've been aided by uh, many different um, generous collaborators, and I'd like to thank all of them and our funding, and thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. Thank you so much, Sunny. That was wonderful. It was a, a real pleasure, and uh, I learned quite a bit on top of it. So, um, as you know, uh, Global Immunity Talks, what we do at the end, we ask, uh, there are a lot of questions, obviously. So, we ask you to seek out these questions, and we ask the people who have listened to you today and who will continue listening to you on Twitter to contact you via Twitter, to, I'm sorry, via X. Sorry, I'm not getting used to it. And uh, then uh, uh, you can engage with, with Sunny there. And so all I have left to say now is thank you all for joining. Thanks so much, Sunny, for joining. And um, have a good day, morning, evening. Take care. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.